Can I have a seat? <clears throat> Church, it's, a, it's an honor to be with you guys today. Um, it really is. I want to invite you to open up your Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. <clears throat> if you don't have a copy of the scripture, that's all right. We're going to have it on the screen. We're going as a church together through the book of Matthew, <clears throat> verse by verse, and we're in a in a series where we're looking at Jesus' miracles, we're looking at his power. And today we're gonna see a story where Jesus casts out um, demons from a demon-possessed man. And it's one of those stories that if you're just sort of skimming through the scripture um, or just reading through it really quickly that um, you're like, okay, that's cool, Jesus healed the demon-possessed guy, that's a really neat, cool Jesus story. But you maybe just breeze on past it, and if you do that, then you really miss that there, there's some gold in the story. If you actually slow down and pay attention, there are some pretty amazing things that we learn about Jesus. And specifically, what we're gonna see is Jesus' absolute power and authority over the evil in our lives, which is amazing when you, when you really stop and see what's going on here in this text. But before I jump in today into, this, into the scripture, I wanna talk for a minute about demons. Because we live in America, you know, 2019 and modern American society, society. And so demons for us, a lot of us are just so outside of the realm of, of our understanding that we, we have a tendency a lot of times to one, ignore them or dismiss them or pretend like they're not there or think they're not real or whatever. And so let's talk for a minute about like what demons are and pr- like why we should believe in them. Um, but the Bible describes demons as these evil spirits uh, or these evil beings that are actively trying to thwart the work of God here on earth. Um, the Bible talks about how they're, they're most likely fallen angels that fell with Satan in his fall and, and now sort of do his bidding. And so what I wanna do is, is I wanna talk for a second about um, what the scripture sort of shows us and why we should believe in the reality of demons because the fact of the matter is a lot of us think it's just the stuff of horror, horror movies and they're not real, like it's fairy tales. But here's, here's the deal. I wanna give you a couple of observations kind of scripturally about why I believe in demons. Now here's the first one. Jesus addressed and he talked about demons a lot, okay? There are several instances in the scripture where Jesus is either talking about, um, he's talking to, or he's casting out demons. And so it becomes problematic for like on one hand to go, yeah, I believe Jesus is everything he says he was. But on the other hand say, but I don't really believe in demons because Jesus most assuredly believed in demons, okay? Now here's the second observation is this, is that one of the reasons that people dismiss uh, the reality of demon and demon possession is because of our advancement in like science and medicine and psychology. Um, people are quick to say today that what folks used to describe as demon possession, we now prob- probably know is something like epilepsy or mental illness. And so, but here's the thing. I, I wanna show you what Matthew, uh, don't turn there, but Matthew 4, 24 kind of shines a light on that idea a little bit. Matthew 4, 24, it says, so his fame, that's Jesus, spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick Um, those afflicted in various diseases, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics and healing them. Now notice that, look at the text there. Notice that, that the Bible actually makes a distinction between all those. It makes a distinction between being sick, having epilepsy and demon possession. And so the New Testament writers were keenly aware that there was things called epilepsy and there was sickness and there was also this thing called demon possession, and they sort of were intentional about making that distinction between them. And so it's entirely possible that what's happening is like in modern society where we're looking at mental illness and, or we may be looking at epilepsy and things like that, and and maybe explaining away some things that might be a a result of demonic or evil activity. Now here's a quote um, from an African theologian as he talks about demon possession in Africa, and I chose it because it's pretty interesting. He says, demon possession is very common in Africa today. The influence of centuries of rationalism has left many Europeans and Americans reluctant to accept the possibility of demon possession. They explain it away using modern theories of psychology and psychoanalysis. We in Africa 
do not have any such difficulties with the idea, and apparently neither did Jesus and his disciples. They recognized that some people were unfortunately slaves to foreign spirits. So casting out demons was a major part of the mission of Jesus and his disciples. And so bottom line, guys, the Bible believes that demons are real. And Jesus believed the demons are real. And so as a Christ follower, I'm gonna believe that they're real. But at the same time, we need to have a proper understanding of them. We need to have a proper understanding of who these things are called demons. So got one more quote here for you from C.S. Lewis as he talks about making sure we don't go overboard with demons. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. And he's talking about demons. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. And so C.S. Lewis is making the point that it's wrong for you not to believe in demons, but at the same time, it's wrong for you to freak out about them and be super concerned about their power, which brings me to the first point that I'm gonna make today, which is this. Point number one, if you're taking notes, the first thing we're gonna see in the scripture is that Jesus has ultimate power over evil, okay? That's all, it's pretty simple. We're gonna see it. Jesus has ultimate power and ultimate authority over evil. Now, if you go to the end of the Gospel of John, John makes a really interesting statement. He makes a statement, he says, that you know, not everything that Jesus talked about ended up in a Gospel that not everything that Jesus did was written down in the scripture. And he said, as a matter of fact, if you wrote down everything that Jesus did, all the books in the world would not be able to contain it. And so the point is, is there are things that made the scripture and there's things that did not make the scripture in the gospels. And so hear this, you know, one of the best things you can do when you're studying the scripture and when you're studying the Bible is to ask this question. Why did the Holy Spirit choose to put this particular thing that Jesus said or did into the scripture? And what is it that he wants me to see through it? Okay, as you're reading the Bible, why, think about it, why did the Holy Spirit choose, out of all the things Jesus did, choose to put this story, these words in the Bible, and what is it that God, you want me to learn from it? And one of the main things that I'm convinced the Holy Spirit wants us to learn today is that Jesus has absolute control, power, and authority over evil. So, so far in Matthew, here's what's been going on. He's been healing people, which was crazy back then. He's healing folks. His huge crowd is gathered around him, obviously. And so he decides to go over to the other side of Sea of Galilee. We learned last week that Jesus gets in the boat, storm comes up, he calms the storm with the sound of his voice. He shows his power over nature and creation. And today what we're gonna see, he's gonna get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is just a big lake. I've been there, it's just a lake. He gets to the other side of the lake and when he gets there, he encounters two demon-possessed men. Well, let's read this together, Matthew 8, 28. It says, when he came to the other side, <clears throat> that's the Sea of Galilee, to the country of the God of Arenas, two demon-possessed men met him. And coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And so he crosses the Sea of Galilee and he, he goes into that part of the country and he immediately encounters two demon-possessed guys. And Matthew tells him that these two guys were living among the tombs. They were demon possessed, they lived in the tombs and Matthew says that they were fierce. That's all he says, they were fierce and they were so fierce that nobody wanted to mess with them. Now the gospel of Mark in Mark chapter five describes the same interaction. Except um, I think Matthew just focuses on one of the demon possessed, no Matthew focuses on two, Mark kind of focuses on one of the guys but Mark goes into some additional detail that Matthew doesn't. And one of the things that Mark talks about is when Jesus walks up and he sees this demon-possessed guy, Jesus actually starts talking to the demon and he asks the demon his name. And so let's check this out, Mark chapter five, verse nine. And Jesus asked him, Jesus is speaking directly to the demon here. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, the demon replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And so Jesus walks up, sees the demon-possessed guy, Starts talking to the demon and says, demon, what's your name? And the demon says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, <clears throat> the, here's the thing about Legion. Legion is a, a term from the Roman Empire. And depending on what period that you're studying the Roman Empire, it can mean anything between 3,500 soldiers and 8,000 soldiers. That was a legion. And so when he asked him his name, this demon says, we're legion. It, the point is, this, this, this guy was not possessed with one demon. 
He was possessed with thousands of demons. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what this guy did wrong, but that's messed up. This guy is possessed by thousands of demons. And so when Matthew describes these guys, he says they're fierce. But again, Mark goes into more detail just about how fierce they are. So check it out, Mark chapter five, verse four. It says, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. And so people were scared of him. So they're like, hey, let's tie this guy up. And so they'd go out there, try to tie him up. He'd break the chains and no one had the strength to subdue him. So he was more powerful than anybody. And then, and then it gets crazier in verse five. He says, night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And so both Matthew and Mark are painting a picture of these guys who were so crazy and they were so powerful and they were so far gone that people were scared to death of them and they would not go anywhere near them. They were completely isolated from community and they were just completely broken. But then one day, Jesus comes walking up. Okay, Jesus comes walking up. And so let's, let's look at the interaction between Jesus and these demon-possessed guys because what, what Mark and Matthew are gonna do is they're gonna give us five clear examples of Jesus having absolute, complete authority over the demonic forces and this evil in the world. Now, if you're taking notes here, I'm gonna have them up on the screen. Here's example number one of Jesus' ultimate power over evil. The demons call Jesus the son of God. The demons call Jesus the son of God. In Matthew 8, 29, it says, and behold, they cried out. And so the, Jesus walks up, the demons start crying out. Watch what they cry out. It says, what do you have to do with us, O son of God? Have you come to torment us before his time? So when the, when the legion of demons see Jesus, they know exactly who he is. Jesus doesn't introduce himself. They don't ask his name. They know exactly who he is. And then the demon calls him by his title. He says, what do you have to do with us, O son of God? They immediately recognize Jesus. They don't think he's just some cool teacher from Nazareth. They recognize him immediately as the son of the living God. And they call him that. And so that interaction explains what James is talking about later on in the New Testament, about how demons think about the Lord. And in James chapter two, verse 19, it says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. And that's what's happening here. They see him, they know exactly who he is. He's the son of God. Now example number two, and this is really funny actually, um, but check this out. The demons are so afraid of Jesus, they, they actually cry out to God for help, right? which is kind of funny. In Mark chapter five, verse seven, it says, crying out with a loud voice, he said, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And I adjure you by God, do not torment me. So they see Jesus coming up, they're like, oh crud, man, that's the son of God. God, help us, man, help us. Which is fascinating, because it shows you who's in charge of the universe. When they see Jesus, they don't cry out to Satan for help, they cry out to God. And they say, God, we know you're gonna take us out eventually, but it's not our time. Can you hold him back? They, he says, I jure you by God that you would not take us out before our time. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> Example number three. This is pretty cool too. Jesus' power over evil is so clear that the demons bow down before him. Think about that. They, they've been in this cosmic battle that we don't see the scripture talks about for I don't know however long and when they actually get in a physical presence of the son of God boom they hit the floor now let's read it um, it says Mark, uh, Mark chapter 5 verse 6 it says when they saw him from afar he he ran the demon the demon possessed guy he ran and fell down before him that phrase fell down before him is the exact same phrase in the Greek that means to worship and so we know that the demons were not worshiping Jesus but what that means is when the demons came into the presence of Jesus, they fell down in awe of Jesus Christ, which is amazing. And, and example number four, the demons know and confess that Jesus will ultimately destroy them. The demons know and they confess that Jesus will ultimately destroy them. Matthew 8, 29. And behold, they cried out, what do you have to do with us, O son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time. And so they know 
that there's coming a day, and it's called Judgment Day, where Jesus is gonna cast the demons and Satan to the lake of fire. They know they're unlimited time. They know there's coming a day where he's gonna take them out. They know that for a fact. And they're saying, Jesus, I don't think it's time yet, so what are you doing? You need to back off. What's going on? Please, they begging, the scripture says, please don't torment us before the day that's appointed for us to go into the lake of fire. And so they're recognizing that Jesus has the authority to do with them whatever he wants, and they're begging him not to do it. And then the last one, which is really, really cool, and I've never thought about this till this week. This is so cool. Example number five. Jesus doesn't call on a higher power to cast out the demons. Jesus does not call on a higher power to cast out the demons. This is so cool. If you study um, ancient Near Eastern religion and literature, ancient Near Eastern literature is full of exorcisms. It's full of exorcism. This was a common thing. They're countless examples of people that saw what they thought was demonic possession and they try to cast it out. Now, listen carefully. Here's the thing. Every single time you see it in that literature, every single time, the person that is trying to cast out the demon always calls on a higher power to cast the demon out. In in other words, every single time you see it, it's always something like they encounter the demon possessed person and they say, hey, I adjure you demon in the name of whatever God. I adjure you in the name of, and they call on a higher power to have the power to cast the demon out. Whenever you see it in ancient literature, they always call on a higher power. But watch what Jesus does. Because it's literally, it's literally unprecedented in ancient literature. Matthew 8.30. It says, now a herd of pigs, a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him saying, if you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. That's incredible. When Jesus casts these demons out, he does not call on a higher power. He doesn't spend time praying. He doesn't get down on his knees. He doesn't look up to heaven. He doesn't even cast, he doesn't even break a sweat. He just simply says one word. He says, go. And the legion of demons heard the word. They don't negotiate. They don't pause. They just went. Now listen, here's the thing. Don't let anybody ever tell you (laughs) That, that Jesus Christ was just a good moral teacher, but, but he wasn't God, okay? Because here's the deal. This is one of the most definitive places in all of scripture and of all of ancient literature where Jesus is making it absolutely clear that he is God. When he casts the demons out, he doesn't call on a higher power. He just says it himself. He says, go, they went. And he did that because he was showing you and me and everybody that there is no higher power for him to call on. So why is the story in the Bible? It's to show you and me that beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have a savior that has absolute, complete authority and power over the evil that is still in this world. You know, one of the things I took away from studying this, this, uh, this week is I reminded about the, the number one command that you see in the Bible over and over and over again. There's one command that is in the Bible more often than any other commands. Don't shout it out, but do you know what it is? It's the command, do not be afraid. I learned that, I think, last year. I read that and I was like, well, really? Because I get afraid a lot. I'm just like that about a lot of stuff. And for, for me to hear that of all the commands of scripture, and there's hundreds, that the one you see come up more than any other one is the command, do not be afraid. Why? Last week, we saw that Jesus has absolute, complete authority over storms, the storms in our life. What we just learned is Jesus has absolute and complete authority over the power of evil in our lives. And what I took away from all this is although Jesus won't keep us from storms and he won't keep us from evil, but he has power over all of it and he will walk through it with us, which is exactly what Psalms 23, four says. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil. He's like, I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't know where that is, but it sounds scary to me. And he says, but I'm not gonna fear any evil as I walk through the valley of shadow of death. Why? Because he says, God, I know you're gonna walk through it with me. So I don't care what storm you're going through. I don't care what evil you're facing. The promise of the scripture is that the one who has absolute power over storms and evil will walk through those things with you. So that's point number one. Don't ever forget it. Jesus Christ has ultimate power over evil and authority. Now, before I jump into the second thing we're gonna see today, I wanna take a real quick look and I wanna wanna stop and look at the town's response to Jesus casting out the demon because it's really interesting. And I don't have some major point here, but I just want to kind of walk through it with you to make sure that you don't have the same kind of response because it's fascinating. The book of Matthew, the story ends where Jesus cast out the demons and, and, and the demons ask if they can go into a herd of pigs and Jesus says, sure. And so they go into the herd of pigs, let's go. They do it, pigs go off the cliff. And when Jesus did that, <clears throat> this man was instantly healed. Instantly, boom, he was completely and totally whole. But the, but the pigs, with the demons in them, went off the cliff. Now look, we don't know why the demons asked to get in the pigs, and we don't know why Jesus said yes. There's, I literally looked at, I probably looked at 50 commentaries trying to find some answer. Nobody knows. I don't know what it means, so I'm not gonna get into it. But the point is, Jesus cats out the demons, they go in a pig, they take off. Now what do you think the response of the, of the town's gonna be? This guy just got healed. I mean, he just did him a favor. This is a dude that everybody's afraid of, they're scared of, he's howling all night, and Jesus heals him. What do you think their response is gonna be? In Matthew 8, 33, he says, the herdsmen fled, which is, which is funny, because the, obviously the, the herdsmen of the pigs were standing there watching this thing, and they just, they just saw their, their pigs take off, demon-possessed, go off a cliff, and they're like, I'm out. And they just they said they ran. And so the herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they, they told everything especially what had happened to the demon-possessed man. So they, they freak out. They're like, dude, Jesus killed our pigs. And then they take off running and they're like, hey, the demon-possessed guys, they're healed. Now watch what the town does. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. So the city's like, what? And they run out there. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. It's fascinating. When the town saw that the demon-possessed Men had been made whole, they didn't rejoice. They didn't bow down and worship Jesus. They begged him to leave. They begged him to leave. Now think about that. When when the demons encountered Jesus' power, the demons said, Jesus, we got to go. But when the townspeople encountered Jesus' power, the townspeople said, Jesus, you got to go. You've got to go. And here's the thing, here's, Here's what I, kind of the one thing I thought about this. I was like, what, what is going on here? Why are they doing that? And I, and I think it's this. I think that when you really, really, really encounter Jesus, when you really encounter him, I'm not talking about the American Christianity fluff, prosperity gospel, therapeutic deism nonsense that's out there so much. I'm talking about when you come face to face with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and you see that kind of power. You're gonna do one of two things. You're either gonna fall down on your face and you're gonna worship him. Or like the town, he's gonna upset your status quo and call you to give something up and and make you walk away from something or kill your pigs or freak you out. And you're not gonna wanna have anything to do with him. In church, I would not be a very good pastor if I did not remind you that the luxury to choose which one of those you're gonna do the choice to worship him or to move him out of your life is a luxury that God only gives us from a really short amount of time. Because the scripture is absolutely clear that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so the town, they saw him, they saw what he did and they said, Jesus, we don't want anything to do with you. They missed their shot. And so real quickly, let's look at the second point of the story. The second thing I, I, I took away from this story, and it's this. Point number two, Jesus has absolute power over brokenness. So not only has absolute power over 
evil in our lives, but he has absolute power over brokenness. So Matthew, Matthew focuses on the reaction of the crowd. They flip out. They try to kick him out of town. But Mark shows us what happened to the demon-possessed guy. And I want us to look at it for a second because it's such a beautiful picture of God's, broke, uh, or God's um, power and love and grace over our brokenness. And so Jesus looks at the the demons, the legion of demons. He says, go, they take off. Now watch what happened. Mark chapter five, verse 15. It says, they came to Jesus. And so the crowd has come to Jesus and they saw the demon possessed man. The one who had had the legion past tense. Watch what it says about him. It says, sitting there clothed and in his right mind. So Jesus cast out the demons, crowd comes running up. When they got there, this former demon-possessed guy was sitting there beside Jesus and he was completely and totally whole. He was just completely and totally healed. But I want you to notice something. Jesus didn't just heal the guy's mind and he didn't just heal his heart and he didn't just heal his soul. If you pay careful attention, he kept going. We know the guy ran around naked and did you catch what the scripture said there? Mark 5, 15, it says, They came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Jesus put clothes on him. I just think that's awesome. I think what that shows is that when we're in a place of brokenness in our lives, when we're in a place in the pit of sin in our lives and Jesus sort of steps into our story and and he begins to go to work in us and we encounter him, I think what that shows is he doesn't just take away our demons but he he wants to take away our shame too. Such a beautiful picture about how God works in broken people's lives. And so this is what I want you to take from the story today. Here's what I want you to hear, take away from the story. I, I want to remind you that this guy, he was beyond repair. He was beyond repair. This guy was so mentally and physically and spiritually gone that every single person had given up on him completely. I mean, think about it. Let's say you were a guy, Jewish dude, you lived in that town, you got two little kids, and every night they're like, Daddy, what's that screaming? What's that screeching? What's that howling noise? Dad, we ran off with some friends and we were down fishing at the Sea of Galilee, and we looked up, there was this dude in the tomb, and he was cutting himself. What's going on? And you're thinking, I, I gotta do something about this. So you grab your buddies and you get some chains and we're gonna, go, we're gonna go tie this dude down. And so you sneak up on him and tackle him and it takes a bunch of you and you tie him up. But then he's like, sweet, be quiet, dude. And you're walking away and boom, he breaks the chains. At that point, you're like, important safety tip. I'm out, right? I'm done. Hide the kids. We might move. We're done. That's who this guy was. That's who this demon possessed guy was. Everybody had completely given up on him, but little did this man know. Little did the demon possessed guy know when he woke up that morning from a long night of being oppressed by demons that he was about to meet a man that even the wind and the waves obeyed. Little did he know that he was about to meet a man who had absolute power. He'd been oppressed by demons who had power, but he was about to meet a man who had absolute power. And that man was gonna use that absolute power not to oppress him in the way the demons had, but we're gonna use his power to free him. So here's a question for you. What does the story teach us about what God wants to do in our lives? I mean, I told you, when you're reading the Bible, you gotta ask the question, why is the story in the Bible and what does God want me to do with it? What does God want me to learn from it? Well, here's what this story teaches us about how God relates to us in our sin and in our brokenness. What it means is that God actually loves the people that nobody else loves. It teaches us that God sees, he looks at, he sees the ones that everybody else have turned their eyes away from. It teaches us that we have a God that pursues people and goes after people that everyone else casts aside. It teaches us that we have a God that that takes people that are bound in chains and oppressed by the enemy and isolated from the love of community and he meets them in their brokenness. He removes their chains. He destroys the power of the enemy with the sound of his voice and he covers their shame in his love. That's how God relates to you and I. When we're in our brokenness and in our sin, 
And guys, I've been doing this long enough to know there's some of you here today, you actually think that you've messed up too bad or that you've done something so bad that God could actually not love you anymore, that God could never use you for his glory anymore. And you know how I know people think that? Because I've thought that. I can't tell you how many times in my life I did whatever again, and I was like, that's it, I've crossed the line. God didn't make the line, I made the line, but I'm like, I crossed the line and that's it, and there's no way God could love me or use me anymore. And church, this story just blows that whole idea out of the water. What the story shows is the reason Jesus came to this planet is to heal people like you and me. The reason the stories in the scripture is to show that there is no sin, there is no brokenness that is greater than the chain-breaking love of Jesus Christ. That's what what it's there for. Now some of you, here's the deal real quick, some of you heard this story and you're like, "Um, I mean, that's awesome. Jesus is incredible, that's really cool. But you, as you hear it, you, you don't really think this story applies to you because in the back of your mind, you're like, I know Jesus needed to save me, but I'm not as bad as that guy was. Like, I know I needed saving, but I wasn't in a graveyard howling at the moon for crying out loud. But here's the thing. If you're here today, guys, and, and you're a Christ follower, I want you to know that that guy's story is your story. More than you'd ever realize Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 tells us that. It says, and this is speaking about everybody, not just guys that were demon possessed in a graveyard somewhere. This is all of us. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. You're in a graveyard in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air before Jesus stepped into your story. You were influenced by the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, just like this guy was the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. And then he keeps going. Ephesians 2, 3 says, among whom we all once lived. That's a pretty definitive statement. All of us once lived in this place in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And watch this. It says, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Every single one of us was dead in our trespasses and our sins. We were following and being influenced by the prince of the power in the air and we were by nature children of God. But look at the next verse, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. It says, but God. Amen. Two best words in the whole Bible. You were in a graveyard. You're being influenced by the power of the enemy. You were walking according to the passions of your flesh. You were by nature a child of wrath, but God. What did God do? Let's check it out. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. All of us were sinful and broken beyond all repair, but God. He stepped into your story and he changed everything. There's something a few years ago that I I saw when I read this and and I didn't know this and I I read it in a commentary somewhere, Hall M told me probably and, and it was awesome. And it blew me away about the story Religious Jews had a phrase that they used for people that lived in graveyards and cut themselves with rocks and howled at the moon. They called them unclean. Dead bodies were considered unclean, and so if you lived in a graveyard, you were considered absolutely unclean. They would not have let you anywhere near the temple to sacrifice. You were unclean. And what's so cool about this is that up to that point in the scripture, up to that story in the scripture, until Jesus, until this story, Every single time something unclean came in contact with something clean, the clean became unclean every single time, but not in this story. In this story, the unclean came in contact with the clean. 
and the unclean became clean. That's what Jesus does. And that's what he offers all of us today. I wanna end today just telling you a real quick story and then I'll pray. <clears throat> Recently, there was a, a young man that reached out to me. I, I'd known him when he was in high school. Came from a Christian family. And um, I thought he was a believer. <sighs> got out of high school, went into college and I'm not gonna go into specifics here, but he got a job where, long story short, he had just unlimited access through his job to drugs and to, to sex. And this kid went sort of as far down that road as I've ever personally seen someone walk down that road. I mean, I, you see movies and you hear stories on TV and stuff, but I'm talking about somebody that I actually knew. Bottom line, this, this kid, and I knew him pretty well, he, he when he went to college, he was in as deep and as dark as a pit as I've ever seen a human being be. I felt somewhat responsible, and, and so I would reach out to him and text him and see if he'd want to meet with me, and he never would. He wouldn't even respond. And out of the blue, not too long ago, he just he reached out to me and asked if, if we could meet, and I said, absolutely. So we met for lunch, and I was already at the table, and when I saw him walk in, I knew immediately that something was different, immediately. There was, a, there was a joy on his face. There was a peace about his countenance that was just obvious. And I thought, man, I bet, I bet he became a Christian. That's what he's here to tell me about. And sure enough, man, we sit down and he's like, man, I became a Christian. And it was, it was, one, of the, it was one of the most fun conversations I've had in a long time. There's something so wonderful about being around people that are still in that first love phase and they're just in love with Jesus. And he goes, Matt. He goes, you know what I realized finally in my life? He's like, the presence of God is like the best thing ever. And he said, you know what, I, it's like when I sin, it, it like keeps me from, from experiencing the presence of God. So Matt, I don't wanna sin, it's crazy. I was like, I know, isn't it awesome? And it was so good and such an awesome conversation. And, and finally, I just, I was like, I kinda wanted to know like what happened and what, you know, what he had all done. I just kept hearing stories. I was like, man, tell me about your story. Like, like, what did you get into? And that sort of thing. And immediately I just, his face sort of just got really sad and he just shut down. And, in, and he was quiet for what seemed like a long time, but I, I finally said, man, don't, you don't have to tell me anything, you know? And he said, no, man, I want to. He said, bro, it's just hard. He's like, he's like, man, I was doing such crazy stuff that it's, it's traumatic for me to talk about it. But he said, I will tell you how I came to the Lord. He said, because it's pretty awesome. A little backstory. He said, Matt, I want to I tell you this. He said, I grew up in a Christian home, but he said, interestingly, it's fascinating now. He said, when I think about it, he said, I never once talked to God the entire time I was growing up. Christian school, family prayed at dinner, youth group, whole nine yards. He said, never one time in my entire life did I ever speak directly to God, ever. He said it was, I woke up one morning. It was this night of unbelievable debauchery, partying. He said, I was so miserable. I was so sad. He said, I was so broken that the only thing that I could think of is that I hated God. I hated God. He said, Matt, for the first time in my life, I spoke to the Lord, and this is what he told him. I said, God, I hate you. He said, as soon as I spoke to the Lord for the first time, God, I hate you. He said, something just started pouring out of me. All that hurt, all that pain, all that darkness, all that sin, it just came pouring out of me. He said, Matt, I'm screaming at God at the top of my lungs. I hate you. And then he said something that was so cool, made me cry. He said, Matt, he said, right in the middle of me screaming that I hated the Lord, he said, man, I heard something. He said, I don't know if I heard the voice of God. I don't know what it was, but as clear as I've ever heard anything in my life, I heard these words. God said, if all you can say to me is that you hate me, that's okay. 
just don't stop talking to me. He said, when I heard those words, it hit me that as desperately as I hated God, that's how desperately he loved me and I fell on the ground and I gave my life to Jesus. Now we can debate all day long about whether or not he heard the voice of the Lord, but church, I'm telling you, all I know is that boy was changed. He was different. I saw it with my own eyes. He was in the deepest, darkest pit of sin and brokenness I have ever seen, but Jesus stepped into his story and everything changed. I believe there's somebody in the room today needs to hear that. You need to hear that. That the reason that the story we just looked at is in the Bible is to show us that no matter how dark the night, no matter how deep the pit you've walked into, there is someone who has the love and he has the power to walk into that pit and take you by the hand and help walk you out. His name is Jesus. Let's pray. If you're here today and you've never met Jesus, you just did. You just heard his words through the scripture. And he's unbelievable. Brett said it earlier. There's nobody in the world that has that kind of power yet displays that kind of love. It doesn't exist. That's who Jesus is. That's the offering. That's the relationship that's being offered you today is to know and experience the love of this God that has infinite power and infinite love. But Matt, you don't know what I've done. Yeah, I know what you've done. He knows what you've done. He doesn't care. He says, I love you. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're gonna have elders and deacons up the front after the service. If, if you're someone that just wants to be prayed for, we'd love to do that. We'd love to help walk you through that stuff. If you're a Christian here today, I, I pray that you are reminded that this man's story was your story and Jesus, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, came and found you and broke your chains and called you to himself. It's worthy of our praise. Thank you, Jesus. Gosh, there are none like you in all the world. You are a way maker. You're a miracle worker. You're a promise keeper. You're a light in the darkness. That is who you are. And it's a joy and a privilege today to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, let's worship together.